Hallelujah. You know, it's, um, it's, it's always a, a blessing to sing songs like that that just completely and totally reflect on the grace of our God who is never in lack. You know, he, 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 he just, he's got it all together. He, he knows exactly what we need, when we need it, how we need it. But he needs you and I to also understand this love that he has for us, this love that is so mighty, so great, that he was willing to send, as, as, as uh, Sharon sang that song, and Calvary is the reason why. When, when we stop and think about Calvary, when we think about what we're going through and the things we have to endure are nothing. I mean nothing in comparison to what Jesus suffered through. And to have that foreknowledge of what was to come and to be looking at these people and watching them turn away, just like you and I are doing today. We watch people leaving the church. We watch people that no longer think God is of, of a purpose. But yet we know, we know otherwise. And so there again, all we can do is be Christ-like and continue to do what Christ has called us to do. And that's to share this, this grace, this grace of God revealed through the finished work of Jesus Christ. We're going to be re reading today in Ephesians chapter 1. So if you want to go there, you can. We will be looking at the Apostle Paul's teaching in Ephesians. Um, and I want to talk about three positions of grace today. Three positions of grace. So if you have your notes, please get them out. And get ready. These three positions of grace are, number one, we are saved by grace. That is the only way you are saved is by grace. And that grace is knowing the Son of God who sent that grace, his name Jesus, to the earth to be born of flesh, to walk this earth, and then to sacrifice himself for us. So number one, we're saved by grace. Number two, we are called to listen into a service by grace. And number three, we are called to a grace-filled life. You're going to hear a lot of that today as I um, continue to dig into Paul's teaching here in Ephesians, it, it's so important to me, and I hope that we get into things that maybe you haven't heard before because it, it's going to be something different. And I know grace is not something you've never heard. It's what you always hear, but I think we're going to look at it from a different position. So the best de definition of grace as seen in the scriptures today is it, it's, a, it's a spiritual gift. It's not something you can lay your hands on. You can't walk up and sign a document and say, okay, give me my portion of grace. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't buy it. There's no way. So it's a spiritual gift from God and something received freely from God. Again, can't buy it. Divine favor and goodwill. It's God's divine favor and goodwill to mankind. Here is my son who I sacrifice for you. Receive him and receive my grace, my love. Look at verse three there. It says, grace is something we need, but none of us deserves it. Grace is poured out of his heart. This comes from God's heart directly to you and I. Look at verse three there. It says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has. See, again, what Paul is, is, is teaching here and speaking here is this. This is not something you have to go through in order to gain more faith, gain more position. You know, it's like at work, you know, you always start at the bottom of the ladder and you have to fight and bite and do all those kind of things. You know, work overtime, be a nice guy when you don't want to be a nice guy in order to grab those rungs and start climbing up the ladder. Our God does not operate like that. He has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. The phrase, who has blessed us, there's a point in this past, somewhere in the past, 
when all and, uh, and not some of these blessings were obtained and given to us. Paul is describing what is already yours. You already have it. You already possess it. It's not something you have to go through things. And, you know, I guess we got to go through this in order for God to bless me, in order for me to understand what God is doing. No, God has already given us all spiritual wisdom and understanding through his son, Jesus Christ. He gave us his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit knows all things. Yes, all things, even the deep things of God. So who do you want to have this relationship with and really get to know so that you understand more and, and can, can see with spiritual eyes what is unseen to everybody else. You know, as we, we're talking about this election, I, I hear all these words. I see these expressions. How good I am. How, how much I've done for you. You know, the, 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 the current administration is tearing it all apart, but I'm not for them. Well, my response is, well, what have you been doing for the last four years? What have you been doing for the last two years? See, if you were doing your job, we may not be in this position because you would be fighting against that opposition. I see no fighting going on. So there again, when we see this, are we hearing words? Or are we seeking God's wisdom on how we should vote, how we should live our lives, how we should operate as believers in Jesus Christ? Do I go to work just to go get a paycheck? Or do I go to have the opportunity to bless somebody, to go to work with the opportunity to increase their joy in that day? Paul is describing what's already ours. These are not blessings to be sought after, but rather blessings to be, listen, listen close, discovered and enjoyed. Write those words down. See, this is, this is what the word of God is about because every time you open it up, it, it's like, a, it's like a, a new novel. I read it. And it's the same thing. You know, as I look at Ephesians right here, chapter 1, you know how many times I've preached messages on this book alone? Hundreds, hundreds of hundreds. And yet every time I open it up, the Spirit of God gives me something new, something that it may be just one word, but that's where I find this, that I have discovered something else that I didn't know before because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, because of God wanting me to know what I already have, he's already placed in me. All I have to do is understand it and now walk in it and operate in it. You know, we have this thing about not laying hands on people. We have this thing about not praying over people. In fact, we do very little praying today. I hope those of you that are saying, well, I don't do that. And I hope you're right. I'm just saying that I, I believe that there's very little prayers going out. That's a different subject. So anyway, we need to fo follow through here because the blessings are being discovered and enjoyed. enjoyed. We have to put our faith in Christ, not headed. Listen, let, me, let me phrase that. Faith in Christ are not headed to victory. If we are in Christ, you hear that word a lot in Paul's teaching, in Christ. We are in Christ. In other words, this grace that we're talking about, we already possess this grace. It's already ours. And every spiritual blessing that is in the heavenly places is already here operating on earth. You know, the scripture also says, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Have you ever stopped and think that everything that starts begins on the earth in that, in that scripture? Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. So there again, it begins with you and I. Are we in this understanding of discovering and enjoying the pleasures that are ours in Christ Jesus? And that we are headed, we are not headed to victory. We are coming from victory. Huh? Uh, amen. Hallelujah. That, see, but all of the time we're, we're looking with the natural and we're looking into issues or problems or situations and rather looking beyond that situation and know that you already have the victory to go through it. 
See, when Jesus was on the cross, did he look down at the crowd? No, he looked beyond the crowd. He looked beyond that, put that time of, of pain and suffering. He looked beyond that and seen you and I. And it was accounted to him as joy. My goodness, look at the cross. Uh, I, I watched the movie The Apostle Paul yesterday. I've been fighting um, something in my body. And uh, so yesterday I spent a lot of time in the Word, and then I um, got out of the Word, and I started to watch TV, and I turned on The Apostle Paul. What an awesome movie. If you've never seen it, you need to get it, and you need to watch it. Talk about a man of faith. And as we know, Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and most of that he wrote from prison. And we know those prisons were not a place of, you know, air-conditioned pinball machines and you know, candy machines. Um, but they were under the depths of the city and all the filth and everything. Uh, but there he remained faithful. He's, he says, I've run my race. Whatever God asked, whatever Jesus asked me to do, I did. I, I didn't lack anything. Everything uh, I did, whatever he told me to do and asked me to do, I have done it. And then turn around and then he was beheaded. <laughs> I have something about that to share a little bit later on. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul says this, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. I want you to focus on that for just a minute because we can't focus on the things of God with the natural mind. We have to begin here in the spirit man, this new, this new creation, this new man that has been brought to new life in Christ Jesus. Again, it's in Christ Jesus. Everything he, you and I are complete in him. We lack nothing. And so therefore we need to understand that the natural man, if we try to do things from this position, we will not understand it. But when we get into the word and we get into prayer and we offer ourselves to God to, to receive from him the understanding that we need in order to do what he's asking us to do, he will, receive, will uh, give it to us. Uh, it says there that the natural man doesn't receive the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So a lot of times we ask ourselves, what's going on? What's happening? Why am I going through this? See, we're trying to figure it out and get through the hard part by using this. And God is saying, come to me. Abide in me as I abide in you. And let me show you how in the spirit realm to bring things to the physical realm. See, that's what Jesus did. He was always speaking in the spiritual realm and seeking the wisdom of God. He says, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only do. Well, when have you ever heard him talk? Well, he was God. No, listen, he was man. He was just like you and I. He was a human being. He was born of the flesh. But he was always seeking the presence of his father because he knew that's where the wisdom was. What God wanted him to do, he wanted to do to please his father. And we're called to do the same. God has made his wisdom available to all who believe in Christ. But the carnal mind will not receive it. See, that's why you can, you can share the gospel of Jesus Christ to so many people. But it just does not make sense. I heard so many people that read, say they've read the Bible, but it absolutely makes no sense. Well, because it's not called for them to make sense. See, God is the one that calls them. And, and he allows things to happen and causes things to happen that will entice them to come to him. They want... I do not believe in... I'm not going to go there. I'll talk about it later. We must remember that the word of God is a spiritual book. So how can we understand it in the natural? See, we can read parts of it. We can understand parts of it from stories that we've heard and, 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 and teachings that we've heard. We can understand it with some of it with the natural mind. But see, it's just like when it comes to our finances or comes to our family or comes to uh, the, the healing. You know, when it comes to all those things, we go, well, God doesn't heal everybody. Well, that's not what the word says. 
See, are we reading what the word says and are we speaking the word or are we speaking what sounds right to us in our natural mind? So the written, it's written under the direction of the Holy Spirit, this Bible is. It was not written for the natural mind. It's too hard for us to comprehend with the natural. It doesn't make sense. Love your neighbors, or I mean, love your enemies. Well, that don't make sense. See, and even if you're looking at, at the healing, I, you've heard me say this so many times, and we've all been through this so many times. Well, if, if healing is for us, then why, why aren't I healed? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? We're going to get into a little bit of that as we go on. They are trying to comprehend it, comprehend it using only our minds or our natural understanding. You're not going to figure God out with this. This was never intended to do or understand the things of God. It's the spirit man that understands the things of God. Why? Because it's spirit. And we will worship him in spirit and in truth. It didn't say with our hands and with our mouths and with our eyes. Yes, those are all part of our worship system because we are flesh. We are human. But yet at the same time, the true worshiper worships worships God from within. The true worshiper seeks the word of God. So as the word of God is spoken, it comes in into our spirit, man, and we gain understanding. And then it makes sense up here. Why? Because it began in the spirit, not in the natural. Am I making that kind of clear? We always try to do things thinking through with our mind. And it can't always be done with our mind. It has to, especially when it comes to the word of God. Uh, in I'll give you an example of this. John chapter 6 and verse 60. I need to get a drink. Excuse me. <clears throat> Many of his disciples, verse 60, when they heard this, and I, had, I started writing this and then I had to put in a deal because you got to understand what they heard. Back in verse 56, Jesus is saying, he who eats my body my flesh, and drinks my blood, he abides in me. Now, now listen, listen, listen to these words. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, here's the key, abides in me. Okay? So now, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they didn't understand this. It's, and apart from the spiritual wisdom, they, they won't understand it. Look, his disciples, it goes on to say, his disciples said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? Now, these are his disciples. They've been walking with him for some uh, distance of time now. So they've been around him and everything, and yet he speaks these words, and they had no understanding because they're trying to think it from here. Remember, they haven't received the Holy Spirit. So everything they're hearing and everything they're trying to understand is all through the natural mind. And so to drink his blood and eat his flesh made absolutely no sense at all. You'd have to agree, right? But listen. So his disciples say, who can understand it? And in verse 63... Jesus gives the answer. Watch this. He says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So again, he's getting the, we're getting the answer that the only way we understand this is from the spiritual realm or the spirit's understanding of what Jesus is saying. You and I know because of our born again spirit, we automatically know what he meant when he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's talking about his crucifixion. He's talking about his death to come. Remember when they were in the upper room, this is later, but in the upper room. And they're having communion together. He said, this is my body. He's handing them the bread. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. So they took of the body and they drank of his blood. But see, they couldn't understand it apart from spiritual understanding. 
So we have to look at these things and seek these things, this wisdom of God through the spirit man who has now been born again and raised up. So you can say, you know, there again, we have to look at, well, how much time do I spend? How much time do I seek after the wisdom of God? Or I just try to, well, God, you said. Jesus was starting, stating that our spirits, not our flesh, uh, are where our life, this new life is being raised up. Uh, in, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 15 there. It says, but he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. So what is Paul stating here? Paul is stating that a spiritual person is someone who is operating, listen, in the wisdom of God and is therefore qualified. You remember back there in verse 3, it says, blessed is... Uh, blessed be the father God and father of the Lord Jesus who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. See, now this all starts to fall back into place and understand because no one understands the way God thinks except the Holy Spirit. So how are we going to understand how God's thinking or what God is, is wanting from us? We have to be operating. We have to be seeking from the spirit realm. What does the word of God say? Where do I draw my strength from the word? Where do I draw my wisdom? From the word. I don't care what's going on in the natural. I only care what's going on in the spiritual realm. And it's when I find this operating of the spiritual realm that the spiritual realm now, when I receive this, believe and have faith in what the word is saying, now it can enter into the physical realm. And now I start operating by what he says, not by what I think is right. Got it? Okay. Back in uh, the second part of Ephesians there, it says, has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. In Christ, we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. There's no lack. None of us lack anything. We are in Christ. Therefore, if Christ is in us and we are in Christ, we are the same. We have been given all the blessings that are in Christ. So is Jesus lacking any blessings? No, absolutely not. We know he is the glorified son of God raised from the dead. We know that all spiritual blessings work and operate through him. And therefore, we have him. We are living in him. We're a part of him. Therefore, we have the same blessings live in us. We are, we, as we believe and act in faith, these spiritual blessings become physical realities. Want me to say that one again? Okay, as we believe, and here's the key, and we act in faith that what we believe is true, that what we read is true, when we believe what we read and we act on what we believe and we do it in faith, these spiritual blessings become physical realities. Boy, y'all getting into this, I can tell. Because you're thinking heavy. Don't think heavy. Just just listen and just understand that there is so much more that God wants to do in and through us. And he's already given us all these blessings, these spiritual blessings. But they're spiritual blessings. See, they're not just bank accounts. They're not just doctors. They're not just nurses and lawyers and all that. It's spiritual blessings that he's given us that we can operate from the spirit world and bring it into the natural world so that others can see our God in operation and glorify his name. Woo! See, it's all about Jesus. It's all about, about Calvary. Calvary's the reason why. Why? So that Jesus was raised. First of all, he paid for our sins. We know that. But he did so much more than just pay for our sins. He brought every spiritual blessing to a reality here on earth. He operated in the spirit realm here on earth in the physical realm. And he's saying, I have given you every spiritual blessing that you can do likewise. He even said, and greater things shall you do because I go to be with the Father. So he's blessing us with all these spiritual blessings. There again, but what we have to do is we have to seek and find. We need to reach out and study and understand what is ours. Amen? It'd be like uh, getting a, uh, 
insurance plan. Yeah, I'm here for insurance, uh, you know, for driving my car. Well, what kind of insurance do you want? Well, you know, just, I want insurance. Just give me the paper and I'll sign it. Well, you have no idea what your coverage is. You have no understanding of what's going to take place or how it's going to take place. Or even if you really will have the coverage you need if you do get in an accident. Trust me, I know. But see, if you don't sit down with the agent and listen to the whole thing and study this and understand what you have available to you, you'll never know. You'll just be driving away. I'm covered. Yeah, but is it 20 cents or is it a million bucks? You don't know. It's the same thing here. Are we operating from the spiritual realm or are we operating from the physical realm? When we talk about our, our relationship with Jesus Christ. Matthew uh, chapter 7 verse 8 says this. For everyone, listen. Now these are the words of Jesus. For everyone, not just some. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now, if you listen to that, those words and what Jesus said, he is saying, whoever, doesn't matter who, okay? Whoever asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds. So there's some seeking that needs to be done, right? And, who, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. So there's this whole realm of seeking and understanding and, and time of prayer and time of in the word and time in the presence of God. In, in, down on our face if we have to. If our situation is, is warned in getting down on your face, my goodness, man, get down on your face. Because the administration and the insurance companies and the tax reliefs and all the rest of it are not going to take care of what our needs are. There's only one who can take care of our needs. And he's the one, he says, all you have to do is ask. You go, well, I've asked. Let me share this with you. Many people have prayed for things that they have never seen come to pass. Anybody here? Come on, raise them up. Yeah, I know you're all afraid to. <clears throat> and in an attempt to reconcile these promises, or these, these promises with our experiences, many have said, listen to this, God sometimes says no. Hmm. or that it doesn't apply to everyone. Some of us sitting here today have heard this type of teaching. But let me tell you this right now. That's not what this verse says. This verse says everyone. Any everyone's in here? Everyone who asks receives. Is Jesus a liar? And if you think I'm taking it out of context, go back and read the whole chapter. And you'll find that the whole chapter works into exactly what he's saying. Those who ask, receive, and he who seeks, finds. See, they're seeking. You have to, but you, you have to understand that when we ask, we ask in faith, that we believe the promise that's been given. See, that's where we, we, we sometimes run a little bit short. Do I really believe that what is mine is mine? If I do, I operate with fullness of faith. Amen. It's mine. I've got it. I'm going for it. I know it's mine. I know it's coming. Why? Because I act on faith. The word says it. I believe it. Therefore, it's done. It's finished. Amen. Why? Because I'm acting on faith knowing what God said is true. Because see, if we're not acting on what God said to be true, if we're saying that this is not true, then God is a liar. There's no other answer. This verse spoken by Jesus clearly states that everyone who asks receives. How can this be, you ask? The answer lies in the fact that God is spirit. And John 4, 24, Jesus says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. What's the key word here? Must. Those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. Not just come and going, I'm in church. I did my part. 
but we worship. We come before Almighty God to lift up holy hands, to lift up and surrender all that we are and stand before a holy God. We are made holy because of Christ. We are in Christ. When he looks at us, he looks through the blood of Christ. You are complete. Lacking nothing. Why? Because of Christ in us. People have said to me, you sound just like your, your dad. You, you look like your dad. Yeah, because we're, 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 we come from the same mold. He was part of my creation. And so I take on these, 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 these gifts. I take on these talents. I take on these opportunities that are given to me because of who my dad was and what he passed on to me. Well, in the same light, we have Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And as he has given to us all things and given us all these spiritual blessings, we should be operating in them. And they should see no difference between us and him. It's called grace. <laughs> I know it sounds simple, and I know, it, I know it's not. But see, it's in the seeking you will find. Knock, and it will be given to you. you have, we have to do something. We just can't go, here I am. Bless me. It's not dependent on God's answer. Listen to me. This is so important because I believe we've been taught this. And that's why people say that God doesn't answer prayers or God says at times, no. I believe it's more in how we ask than if the answer is no. Because first of all, his name is love. Right? And so where does the no? Yes, the no sometimes comes from a father of love because he doesn't want us to get ourselves into something that is, is not good for us, but I'm talking about something different here. We're talking about this position of we're in, we're in or we're seeking after the understanding or the spiritual blessing that is already ours, and I'm seeking after the answer to the blessing, and now as I seek, I get the, the response back. You can say, well, how does that work when it comes to healing? First of all, you have to have faith that it's already taken care of. Well, no, he gave his doctors. Yeah, he did. Bless his heart. <laughs> Luke was a physician. I mean, there's been doctors all the way through time. But who is the great physician? Who is the great healer that knows more about your body than any doctor scientist living today on earth? And what does his word say? By his stripes, you're healed. Yeah, but see, there it comes. Are we walking in victory or are we seeking after victory? God has given to every one of, uh, one of us everything that it takes to walk in victory, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What does that mean? That means everything that we need has already spiritually been deposited in our bank account. You already have it. All we have to do is understand what we have and start operating on what we know is truth and what we know we've been given. Then we will see this start taking change in our spirit man and it will influence our physical man and we'll see the, the, uh, the evidence being brought through the physical realm. It doesn't just, it doesn't mean, listen, I think a lot of people think that it's God going doop and touching you with his healing finger. And that's not it. The healing was taking place through his son, Jesus Christ. Did Jesus Christ accomplish everything he was sent to do? And was everything he spent sent to do only forgive our sins? Or it was to, first of all, forgive us our, our sins or to pay the price of our sins. And second of all, to take the power of Satan and diminish it. I mean, uh, he, didn't, he didn't totally get rid of it because he's still active. But he gave us the power over Satan. What is sickness? Sin. 
What is poverty? Sin. What is all these things that are worldly or in the physical realm all became a part of our life because of sin? Sin's already been dealt with. Plus, on top of that, now we see that the healing was taking place. And so, so are we going to believe that or are we going to believe what our body's telling us? See, right now, my stomach is churning like you can't believe. If you've ever had this, whatever it is, I give it no name because I've already rebuked it. I already know I'm healed in Jesus' name, but it keeps coming back and going, mm. So does that mean I'm not healed? Absolutely not. I was healed 2,000 years ago, and I'm standing on that. You can growl all you want. You can give me this uncomfortable, sickly feeling all you want, but all I'm going to do is tell you I'm healed. You may as well just get on out of here because I'm not receiving the sickness. I'm not receiving the fact that you're growling and upset and want to just cause all these things to happen in my body. I take, I take power over my body. Because Jesus Christ gave me that power. I walk in victory, not in defeat. This is to say that our spirits, where God has deposited all of his power and glory. Listen, listen. God has de deposited all of his power and glory and locked them inside our flesh. Think about that for a minute. Where does he dwell? Well, who dwells in you? The spirit of the living God. <laughs> I think, I, I just, that just, that blows this thing out of proportion. This cannot understand this, this spiritual wisdom that I'm speaking right now. My mind, my own mind is having a hard time understanding what my mouth is speaking because my mouth is speaking from here and from here. Not from here. Because this says, that don't make no sense, bud. You're hurting. Your stomach is upset. You've got this, you've got that. No, I don't. I'm healed. I walk in victory. I talk to my body. I take power over my body. Because Jesus has given me the authority to do that. Whew. As we are renewed or transformed in our minds, remember what Romans 12, 2 says, that we, are to we, are, we have been transformed by the renewing of our minds? That's this. Well, how do we renew this? By this. And by seeking after the wisdom of God in everything we do. James uh, 2.20 says, faith without works is what? <laughs> Kaput. So see, if, we're, if we're, we're believing we have faith, but we don't have any works to, to show our faith and trust in what God has said, guess what? We have no faith. It's dead. It has no, it has no action to it. Faith is an action word. It's a verb. So when we when we hear the word or we hear something from God, from the spirit of God, we act on it. That's called faith. We can experience the divine flow through our, our physical body. It's God that heals me. I don't care what scientist says. Doesn't matter. It's God. Why? Where did the wisdom of scientists come from? Duh. Who gave them the, 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 the mind and the knowledge and the understanding to create these pharmaceutical needs? God, not man. The wisdom of your doctor didn't come from a school. It came from almighty God. Everything was created by him and for him and everything comes down from the father of light. So who do we seek first? This is just, uh, just as in the physical muscles, listen, in our physical bodies, muscles need to be what? Come on. Treadmills. Pedal bikes. <clears throat> ooh, ooh, ooh. 
What is that called? Exercise. In order to have strong muscles, you've got to work them. See, if you sit on the couch all day long and watch TV, the next thing you know, everything goes. <laughs> it seems to fall. We call it gravity. No, that's laziness. We need to work up. We need to exercise. We need to do the same thing with our faith. We need to do the same thing with our spiritual walk with Christ. We have to build up. We have to continually work, work out, so to speak. Prayer is one important way of exercising ourselves in godliness. And this was why Jesus warned his disciples to pray and watch. Do you remember? He took them into the garden with him. And he said, now you just sit right here and you pray and you watch. Keep alert. What happened? Same thing that happens to us. Five minutes into the prayer. <laughs> Did Jesus know it? Oh, yeah. So he come back and he woke him up. And it happens to me. I know it happens to you. And the spirit wakes you up and you're going, what was I thinking? I, I'm, I was praying, and then all of a sudden I start thinking about something else or drifted off. And so he shakes you a little bit, and you come back to praying again. Jesus did the same thing. Well, what was he saying? Stay awake, watch, and pray. Be alert. We can't be sleeping through this. Look at verse 4. We're finally going to get to verse 4 here. It just says he chose us. Watch this. Watch this. This is so important. He chose us in him. In who? Here comes the word. In Christ. Everything points to Christ. We are saved because of Christ. And when we're born again, we're born again into the image and likeness of Christ. That's why it says Christ in us. So let's, let's read on. Uh, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, don't, don't, don't go off drifting now. Stay with me because I'm going to prove that fact wrong. The foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That we should, listen, listen, should be holy and without blame before him in love. What is grace? Love. So if God, if God did all of this for us, shouldn't we be doing the same thing? If he sought after us, shouldn't we be seeking after him? If Jesus did all this for us, shouldn't we be seeking to find out what it is he did for us? Or are we satisfied with just one thing? He died on a cross and took away my sins. Hallelujah. Got my fire insurance. Maybe that's why we walk around disgusted, busted, and unhappy. Because there's more to this than just salvation. You heard me say that so many times, and I'm going to keep saying it. Because it blessed my heart when God gave me that, that, that idea, that understanding. There's more to me than this. It's called grace. It's the table of grace. And in, on that table is not just bread and wine. It's all the things that Jesus accomplished when he went to that cross, when he overcame death and was raised from, from the dead into a new life that gives us hope. This morning I was yelling out, do you hear it? Do you hear it? The trumpet's coming. But see, if we're so busy in our everyday life, will we be ready when the trumpet sounds? Will we hear it? You know, it's amazing. They, they always say that when a tree falls in the forest, does anybody hear it? Not if there's nobody there. But it still makes a sound, doesn't it? I just pray everybody's going to hear the sound. But are we preparing ourselves? Are we living this life in Christ? Are we operating from a Christ-like position, a position of victory? Because he overcame all the works of, day, of, the, of the devil, all the works of Satan. He overcame all of them. So why do we accept the fact that we're sick? Why do we accept the fact that we have to walk around busted and disgusted? 
I, I, don't, I, I, I don't comprehend this. Not anymore, I don't. The Lord, listen, the Lord did not choose us on our merit. Hmm. But solely on one thing, our acceptance of Christ. Man, that's a powerful word. Listen, God did not choose us on our merit because of who we are, but solely on our acceptance of who Christ is and what Christ has done for us. See, that changes the whole outlook. See, if we're only looking that he died for us so that we could have eternal life, we're missing out on all the other parts of him and the works of him, the completions of him that he provided for us, and we wonder why we don't have anything. Well, I'm just sitting back waiting for Jesus to come back. Well, see, show me that in the Bible. Jesus said, now you are my disciples. Go. Don't sit on your blessed assurance. Get off your derriere and go do what I've called you to do. And what is that? Preach the gospel. Lay hands on the sick. The sight, the, the, the blind to see. The lame to walk. They did that. Well, that was for the apostles. See, we told you that's for the apostles. No, he was saying that to the church. Paul teaches that. Paul points out here in verse 4 that God chose us in Christ. This is the important part. Listen, there's a lot of talk out there. There's been a lot of teaching over the years about predestination. You know, well, I don't know if God chose me, so I don't know if I'm going or not, so why should I choose him if he doesn't choose me? Now, well, wait a minute. We're not paying dodgeball. You're a captain of the team, and I'm a captain of the team. Now we're going to choose our players. Is that, what we, is that the picture we have of God? Sitting and going, oh, I choose you, but I don't choose you. But yet that's what we're being taught to, to understand. But what he, listen, what he said was that he chose us in Christ. So Christ had to be a part of this plan of grace. He had to be. It wasn't God at the foundation of the earth says, oh, I chose these people, but I don't choose those people. I choose this one, but I don't choose that one. No, it's all in the acceptance, yours and my choice, to choose Christ. See, it all comes back to Christ. Who paid the price? Christ did. See, if, 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 um, if, if uh, uh, I don't want to use the word adoption, if this uh, understanding of, what was I just said? Um, this choice thing. What was it? Just went from my mind. I guess I'm not supposed to talk in. Huh? Predestination. See, if that's true, then I have a question for you. Why did Christ have to die if God already chose you? Huh? See, that do now, now, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense here, and it don't, surely doesn't make any sense here. See, if I'm already chosen, why would God have to send his son to die on a cross for my sins when I've already been chosen by him, and I'm going to spend eternity with him? See, it's all, listen, it was from the foundation. Yes, from the very, very, very beginning, we know back in Genesis, God already had a plan. God knows man's going to fall. He's going to fail. But this is what I love about my God. He already had a plan to save me. And I wasn't even born yet. But he knew I was going to sin because I was born into sin. But the plan was to send his son to save mankind. That was the foundation, not the pre-part. That is the pre-part of understanding that we needed a savior. And it's Christ Jesus. And we only are saved through him because of what he did. All glory and praise go to him. Praise the name of Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And at his name, all will bow. So get over yourself. Learn how to get down on them knees. I believe that God did not use his foreknowledge. Listen, I, I, I did a lot of meditating on this. 
God did not use his foreknowledge because he knows all things. Are we agreed on that? Okay. But I don't believe he used his foreknowledge to the extent that he knew every move that man was making. And just listen to what I'm saying. No reason is given for us or for this, but certainly one reason is that on absolute use of God's foreknowledge, he would have hindered his love relationship with man. Huh? Think about that for just a minute. See, if it was all about what we do, how could he love us? And so even when he knew Adam would fail and would sin, he still allowed him to do it, but he also had the plan of salvation in place because one day you're going to have to choose between your life on earth and eternal life with Jesus Christ in heaven. You choose. I lay before you blessings and cursings, life and death. Why would he put that in there if it wasn't true? Oh, that's Old Testament. Well, get off yourself, man. So is all that predestination stuff's all Old Testament. We are in Christ. We are made a new creation. We choose Christ. He chose us from the foundation. This is the choosing. You're going to fall. But I'm not going to hold you on all of this condemnation. I'm going to send you a savior, my son. And he's going to pay your debt and give you the opportunity to choose a new life in him. So who does the choosing? Well, God chose to send his son. That's the choosing he made. And then it's up to us to choose his son. And there's many that will not choose him. How am I doing here? Okay. Oh, hallelujah, God is not man. <laughs> I wrote that down there. I had to write that down. I had to, God, hallelujah, God is not me. He's not like me. Because there are, there are times that I hold things against people, then he has to turn around and remind me, how can you love like I love? How can you love like my son loves if you're holding something against somebody? Who are you? <laughs> Let me remind everybody, we were not personally chosen. Christ was chosen. The Bible says over and over, he is the chosen lamb. He is the chosen lamb. Son of God. Amen? Christ was chosen, and all those who are in Christ partake of his being chosen by the Father. That's how we got here. That's the only way to the Father. Jesus said it himself. So is Jesus a liar? Because he said, there's no way unto the Father except through me. So what happened back here? That don't matter. Forget that. It's Christ is the only way. No other way. We are the beneficiaries of a covenant, covenant between God and his son. That's worth, that's worth holding on to for a moment. It's a covenant between God and his son, the anointed son of God. Galatians 3.29 says, If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and therefore heirs according to the promise. Who's the promise? Christ, salvation, freedom. We are chosen because we chose God's son. His name is Jesus. The father would no more reject us than he would reject his son. Well, you got to hold on that for a minute. Well, see, if this a predestination is the case that we were chosen by God, he chose this one and not, we're back to playing dodgeball again, you know, choosing a team. See, if that was the case, then what Christ did made no sense. It had no, had no purpose. Adoption. Got to go there. I like the word adoption rather than predestinated. I was adopted. You and I who are believers. Adoption was a term used only by the Apostle Paul. That's a good one to write down. It found its roots in the Roman culture, not in the Jewish culture. 
through adoption, listen, old ties were severed. This is what adoption means. Old ties were severed and the new father became full owner of the child with all legal rights. Man, that should make you happy. Are you adopted? Yeah, we're adopted into, into, the, into the family of God. God has cut away the old way. In other words, the, the old works of Satan have been cast away. They've been cut off. See, if, if we still continue to do what is wrong, it's by choice. Because he's already redeemed us from the curse. He's already taken it out of the way. All Satan can do is tempt you. And where does he tempt you? In the mind. That's why we have to renew our mind daily. How? By the word of God. I'm going to end with this. I got so much more going on. But there's something I want to share with you at the end of this. And uh, <clears throat> in verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 4, uh, we are called to live grace-filled lives. Listen to this. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. In other words, I don't care what the world's doing. What we're doing, are we doing it to please God or to please man? But if we do it, we're doing it in the futility of our own mind. It begins here. Do I operate from God's position here or from this position? Amen. This means that a life centered in the spirit, a life dedicated to service. Therefore, we need to build, we need to be a, not build, but be a monument of God's grace. Do they say God's grace in us? I want to share this. I wrote it down. As I told you, I watched the movie yesterday, the Apostle Paul. And at the very end, he said something that just enlightened my spirit says, we are sailing in this life from birth to death. Life is like scooping up a handful of water that immediately begins to slip between your fingers until all that you hold dear in this life is gone. Yet the kingdom that I speak of live for and is like the rest of the water out in the sea, the vast open sea. Man lives for that cup of water that slips through his fingers, but those who follow Jesus Christ live for the endless expansion of the sea. In this moment, Christ awaits to fill you with a vast endless sea of, these are my words, by the way, vast sea of internal life. If you have not felt his presence, but you know hearing his vo you're now hearing his voice calling you, today is the first day of the rest of your life. But seeking the water that runs away. But seeking the living water that is eternal. And so if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is your day. It's Christ that's calling, it's not me. It's Christ you're seeking. It's not the things of this world. Because the world is looking for something that's happy. The world is looking for something that is joyful. The world is looking for something to love or someone to love, or be loved. And you and I are it. We are the people of God. Amen? Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of gathering here in the name of Jesus, the name above every other name. It's at his name we bow. It's his name we seek. It's his face we seek. Father, it's his goodness. John chapter 1, verse 1 says he's the living word. So when we seek the word, we're seeking him because he is a living word. And so, Father, as we seek, may we find. As we knock, may the door be open so that we, we understand what you've already blessed us with. All spiritual blessing in heavenly places. It's already in our account. It's not something we have to seek after. It's something that's already there. All we have to do is dwell in your presence. 
Seek your Holy Spirit. Let him reveal. Give us revelation knowledge of this great grace. Jesus said, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood, they abide in me. And so, Father, today we thank you for the calling. We thank you for the answered. And, Father, for those that you are calling now, I just pray that the Spirit would lead them into standing, yielding. Say, here I am, Lord. You've been calling for a long time. But I need you more now than ever. And I want to be a part of your spiritual team to be blessed by Almighty God. To be forgiven by the blood of your precious Son, the Lamb of God, chosen from the beginning of the earth, beginning of time, so that today, my day, I can give this up and yield to you knowing there's so much better. There's so much more. And Father, we receive that as you receive it because no request goes unanswered. And so we just thank you, Father, for your son. We thank you for this time of gathering today in his name. And we pray this. We seek your face. We thank you, Father, for those that are here today and those that are will be watching on, on uh, uh, our our facebook network father we just pray that even then after we're gone and they're watching if you're calling receive their call because we know you hear us and we just so thankful be with us now as we leave here send your angels charge round about us according to your word protect us and keep us we love you and we thank you for all that you have done to us through us in the precious name of your son jesus christ amen and amen